There seems to be a nearly universal experience when North Americans visit Europe for an extended period of time. They start to feel better. And although a healthy amount of this healthy feeling is due to exercise and lifestyle, many people have argued that there seems to be something different going on with the food. So is there some truth behind it? Is the food here in Europe really of a higher quality than the food that we get in the United States? Or is this more fiction than fact? To understand this question, we have to break down what quality actually means. Take a look at things like access to food, importance of seasonal foods, food production, food regulations, and finally, food flavor. Because hey, quality food should also taste good too. So let's get started. You know, to be honest, although the comment section of many of my YouTube videos might actually suggest otherwise, I don't personally think it's a good idea to make blanketed statements like the food in Europe is universally better than the food in the United States or vice versa for that matter. The quality of food in both regions can vary widely depending on several factors, including the specific country or region within Europe or in the United States, the type of food product, production methods, regulations, and of course, individual preferences. Regardless of which region you happen to live in, you can find pockets of extraordinarily good food and exceptionally bad food. But if we're gonna try to understand differences in food quality, I think the best place to start is simply by just looking at who has access to quality food, something that is actually surprisingly difficult to find in many regions. Many of you might be familiar with the term food deserts, a geographic area where residents access to affordable, healthy food options, especially fresh fruits and vegetables, is restricted or non-existent due to the absence of grocery stores within convenient traveling distance. When a person lives in a food desert, this just generally means that a supermarket is more than a mile away in an urban area or more than 10 miles away in a rural area. This can be, of course, manageable if your family has a car, but 2.2% of Americans live in food deserts and don't have a car or access to public transportation, making it nearly impossible to achieve food security. And you might be thinking, Ashton, that's just 2.2%, big whoop. But that's about two and a half million people. That's the entire city of Chicago. But access to food isn't just simply about proximity, but also access to healthy, affordable options. And when we don't have healthy options around us, this is actually something called a food swamp. Places where there is an abundance of unhealthy food options relative to healthy food options. And this link between food swamps and diet-related behavior and obesity has been well-documented in many studies. People's choices about what to eat are severely limited by the options available to them and what they can afford. And many food deserts contain an overabundance of fast food chains selling cheap meat and dairy-based foods that are high in fat, sugar, and salt. Processed foods such as snack cakes, chips, and soda, typically sold by corner delis and convenience stores and gas stations, are usually just as unhealthy. And again, this is something that both Europe and the United States actually have in common with one another. However, the US is an outlier amongst other similarly wealthy nations when it comes to the prevalence of food insecurity. One in six Americans report running out of food at least once a year, whereas in many European countries, this number is closer to one in 20. And the rate of growth in food insecurity in the US is far greater than many other developed nations. In the late 1960s, America had 9.6 million food insecure people. By 2021, this number had grown four and a half times to 44.2 million, or about 13% of the overall population. In 2020, for comparison's sake, a smaller 8.6% of the EU population were unable to afford a meal with meat, fish, or a vegetarian equivalent every second day. And the fact that more Americans are food insecure than Europeans should really shock us all. After all, the United States has double the farmland base than that of the EU, over a billion acres versus 418 million acres, respectively. But here's the kicker. The EU has five times as many farms, at 10.6 million with an average size of 39 acres. 
compared with just 2 million U.S. farms averaging 485 acres. In the United States, federal farm policy traditionally has focused on price or income support programs concentrated on row crops, including grains, oil seeds, and cotton, as well as sugar and dairy. But in contrast, the EU, under its common agricultural policy, provides extensive support to a broader range of farm and food products, including livestock products and fresh and processed fruits and vegetables. The EU tends to have a stronger rural development emphasis and allows frequent exemptions for identifiably small farming units from certain cross-compliance restrictions and payment limitations. And ultimately, this means that fresh fruits and vegetables and meat are not only more readily available from local farmers to local consumers, but they also tend to be cheaper as well. It's clear that food quality hinges on quality food. But access to quality food isn't just simply about proximity. Again, a lot of this also boils down to choice and consumer preferences about the kinds of foods that they want to have in front of them. And for me, one of the biggest examples of this is the consumer preference here in Europe for seasonal foods. You know, cooking with seasonal produce is often regarded by the best chefs as the key to more flavorful meals. But whether for financial reasons or time constraints, Americans seem to want their produce available all months of the year. There's virtually little to no change in the vast majority of American supermarkets throughout the year. You're gonna find the exact same produce, whether it's July or January. And ultimately, this does in fact impact taste. Buying out of season means the produce has to be picked long before it is ripened and then shipped very long distances from the Southern United States or Mexico or Central America. That journey can batter the flavor out of fresh fruits and vegetables. So when you hear people from older generations saying things like, the food 50 years ago used to taste better, well, they might not actually be wrong. Perhaps the best example is the tomato. They're incredibly popular and they're often considered the highest value vegetable crop worldwide. A tomato's flavor is determined by sugars and acids, which activate our taste receptors, and a set of volatile compounds, which trigger our smell receptors. The combination of the two creates the unique flavor that makes a perfect fresh pasta sauce, or hey, my favorite, a BLT, so delicious. Today, tomatoes are bred to travel long distances without getting bruised and sit in storage without going bad. According to a 2017 study published in the Journal of Science, this genetic shift has led to a significant drop in the volatile compounds that contribute to a tomato's aroma, which means we're getting a less tasty product. Now, while the tomato certainly gets a lot of attention, it isn't unique. There are a lot of crops which have been bred to accommodate modern agricultural methods which also means it's very likely that they probably lost a lot of the flavor that they once had. But please don't get me wrong, Europe still definitely has its year-round produce as well within their supermarkets. I can still buy oranges and bananas all months of the year. But the difference is that the locals will generally demand and pay for better quality and ultimately better taste. Right now is actually one of my absolute favorite times of year because kale is in season and I can buy it in bulk from local producers from right here in my region. And ask any German about their passion for asparagus season. There are entire festivals dedicated to this seasonal vegetable and local grocers bring out special machines to peel white asparagus so that you can enjoy this delicacy at peak freshness. And it's not just Germany, the Italians are just as passionate about the tomato growing season. And the French have incredibly high standards for their cheese. And there's little compromise when it comes to olive oil consumed along the Dalmatian coast and the Aegean Sea. And purchasing foods that are in season not only means that consumers get to enjoy the flavors of that particular time of year, but they're also probably more likely to support local growers, producers, and farmers. Which leads me to my next point. Research shows that roughly 12% of Americans shop at farmers markets regularly. And despite the growing number of fresh produce markets available to American citizens, 93% of organic sales in America still occur in a conventional supermarket setting. And there really is such an important connection when we talk about food quality that has to do with the supply chains that provide us access to that quality food. 
There's a guy named Henry Klee, who's a horticulture professor at the University of Florida, and he spent years developing a nutrient-dense tomato that also happens to taste great. It's been called by a panel of 500 experts, one of the most delicious tomatoes on the planet. And it actually isn't grown in the foothills of Mount Vesuvius like Italy's famous San Marzano tomatoes are. No, instead it's grown in Gainesville, Florida. Klee's tomato, the garden gem, is durable, with a great shelf life and track record of disease resistance, properties growers care about. So why isn't it available on store shelves across the country? Well, unfortunately, the garden gem is a little too small, about half or a third the size of your average supermarket tomato. And that means it would require more labor to pick and therefore a little bit more cost. Yeah, that's right. The tomatoes that Americans eat en masse have been bred for things like durability, production, high yield, and disease resistance. Quite frankly, deliciousness doesn't really count for much. That's why you see gigantic strawberries and fist-sized apples on store shelves. Since Americans like their produce big, and big fruit is more efficient to grow, growers do everything they can to supersize their fruit even at the expense of flavor. But that isn't necessarily the consumer preference here in Europe. In comparison, on average, 15% of all EU farms sell more than half of their production directly to consumers, with the highest share of farms involved in direct sales located in Greece, Slovakia, and France, where a whopping 50% of farmers who sell vegetables and or honey do so within what are termed short food supply chains, abbreviated SFSC, a supply chain involving a limited number of economic operators committed to cooperation and close geographical and social relations between producers, processors, and consumers. For farmers, selling agricultural products through these short food supply chains allows them to retain a greater share of that final sales price which can represent a significant source of income for them, allowing for them to either reinvest it in their farm or to modernize their production processes. There are also benefits for the consumers who get fresh and seasonal products traceable known to a producer. They can reconnect the food they eat with the farming process. In addition, such local markets and SFSCs enable people with low incomes to buy healthy food at an affordable price. In a more general way, they create better understanding and a relationship of trust between producers and consumers. Plus, products sold in local food systems are generally produced in an environmentally sustainable way, using less of input such as pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, animal feed, water, and energy. They require less packaging than in supermarkets and less energy for storage, as they're fresh and seasonal. Less transport also means energy savings and reduced environmental impact. And I'm gonna preface this statement with this is 100% my own perception and opinion, but I would say that the consumer preferences for seasonal foods produced by local farmers is so much stronger here in Europe. And this is coming from somebody whose dad is a farmer in the United States. Whether it's shopping at a farmer's market or the display and marketing of regional foods at a traditional supermarket, consumers in Europe, in my opinion, have a much stronger preference for supporting local farmers and shortening those food supply chains for their food. Now, I've made plenty of videos in the past where I discuss things like food additives and chemicals that might be banned in one region but allowed in another. And part of that discussion is also just how different regulators are between the United States and Europe, specifically in how cautious they are with new additives and chemicals. And if you wanna watch more, I'll go ahead and link those videos down below in the description. But the bottom line is that on a whole, the food in both Europe and the United States is incredibly safe to eat. But what is abundantly interesting is that when it comes to food quality, Europeans and Americans seem to ask very different things from their regulators. In the US, the primary concern of regulators are safety and tax revenue, as opposed to quality. But in the EU, you have subregions, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Schwarzwald, Toscana, and they each have rules about actual production practices, and importantly, a regulated and legally protected designation of origin certification. This European regulation is intended to guarantee the reputation of regional products and inform consumers that products bearing the protected designation of origin logo comply with the conditions of production and origin specified by the designation. 
And this regulation applies to a whole host of agricultural products where there is a link between the product itself and a specific geographical location. Things like wine, cheese, ham, sausages, olives, beers, fruit, vegetables, and bread. Foods such as Parmigiano Reggiano, Gorgonzola, Asiago cheese, and champagne that can be labeled as such only if they come from the designated region. For example, to be marketed under the Roquefort designation of origin, a cheese must be processed from raw milk from a certain breed of sheep, and the animals must be raised in a specific territory, and the cheese obtained must be refined in a very specific cellar in a very specific French department, where it must be sealed with mold spores prepared from traditional strains endemic to these same cellars. And listen, I get it, a lot of these rules seem extraordinarily complex, medieval, and maybe a little bit bourgeois. But the truth is, these people really take these things seriously because these foods don't just inherently have cultural value, but tradition that is rooted very heavily in taste and production. And that's a heritage that they want to protect. And that sense of food tradition and heritage, though, doesn't really seem to be as strong in the United States. Quite frankly, the only thing I can really think of that that might be somewhat applicable to is Kentucky bourbon. But I think ultimately, if we're trying to really get down to the bottom of whether or not European food is of a higher quality than American food, I think we also kind of have to talk a little bit more about taste. And yeah, I know that's really difficult because taste is subjective. Taste is just one component of what's known as flavor, which is an incredibly complex mixture of what the tongue literally tastes, what the nose smells, things like texture, and how all of that comes together to determine our perception. And ultimately, I think it is really, really difficult to kind of paint the entire region with a single brush when it comes to flavor. I mean, you can find incredibly tasty foods in both the United States and in Europe. But I will say, as an American, I would generally agree with the statement that Americans tend to care more about convenience and size more than they care about flavor. And if tomatoes are any indicator, for sure, European tomatoes, especially from Italy, just taste better because they were bred and harvested with that as a top priority. And you know, I've been pretty lucky that I've traveled to about 15 different European nations now, which I know, I know, definitely leaves me a lot of places that I still have yet to go to. But one of the things that I found to be universally true is that food here in Europe tends to be a bit more simpler and focus more on the individual flavor of the ingredients. And that's quite a bit different from the heavily processed foods that dominate the American landscape. And I can't help but think that having a more flavorful base ingredients also probably is a contributing factor to the European approach to food and health. You know, the average number of ingredients in an American restaurant salad or pasta is eight to 10, while in Italy, the average salad or pasta only has four or five ingredients. And listen, I'm a Midwestern girl at heart who loves ranch dressing as much as the next person, but I can very much understand that if the lettuce and the tomatoes just taste so good, why would you wanna cover that up with a heavy dressing? And maybe that's potentially why there's so much more of a dominant use of just simple oil and vinegar to dress your salads here in Europe than there is the United States. But I would also wager that perhaps one of the biggest differences between Europe and the United States all kind of goes down to the consumers themselves. Convenience culture is a real thing in the US and often, again, this supersedes taste. Maybe delicious produce is more readily and widely available in Italy because the Italians won't stand for anything less. Maybe French producers get more excited about their microclimates and soil conditions and the impact that that has on food and wine when they interact with local traditions than maybe American food producers do on average. But this is actually where I would love to hear from you down in the comments section. Again, taste is inherently subjective. So what do you subjectively think about the taste of food that you've experienced in Europe and or in the United States? Was there a particular dish that stood out to you that just really blew your mind from a flavor taste perspective? And how do you think that links to how that particular food or ingredient was produced? Let me know down in the comment section below. And as always guys, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So 
I'll see you next Sunday. Cheers.